Hi and welcome. This is uh, our fourth and final session of this module where we're talking about the Bible, what the Bible is. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the session so far. In the first session, we spoke a bit about the power of God's Word, how the Word actually has life-giving power and life-changing power, the authority of the Word, how the, the Word is God's Word. The Bible is, is, um, has authority, it's normative in our lives, it has authority over our lives, so it can make demands from us. It, it, it demands that we change our lives. Uh, like some people say, uh, when, when God gives the law, He doesn't give the Ten Suggestions, He gives the Ten Commandments. Um, then we also spoke about the reliability of the Bible and why we can trust the Bible. Spoke about, about a whole um, range of stuff from infallibility of Scripture, canonicity of Scripture, how do we decide what comes into the Bible, uh, which books got, uh, got left out, and a little bit about just the textual transmission and how that actually happened uh, reliably and um, how what we have now is what we originally had, uh, what was originally written down. So today we're going to focus on just reading the Bible, consuming the Bible. Remember we started off and we said consume the Word until it consumes you. And we're going to focus in on that uh, today. And I think you're going to really enjoy this. This is where it really gets practical. Uh, this is where the rubber hits the road. So uh, pay attention, really allow the Holy Spirit to, to um, ignite this in your heart. Uh, we must consume the word until it consumes us. Remember we said that if we want to know someone, if we really want to know who they are, we, we, we must accept what they say about themselves. It doesn't help I come to my a friend and say, listen, um, you know, I like to think of you as a person who, you know, and then sort of tell them who I want them to be. Now, if I want to know them, I must... I must let them tell me who they are. And the same for God. And the only place we can really do that is with the Bible, with God's Word, because that is where He reveals, not only through what He says, but through what He does, He reveals who He is. So, <clears throat> I like to ask Christians this question. Who of you will read the Bible for the rest of your life? And invariably, you know, if someone's a Christian, you know, almost everyone puts up their hand and says, you know, me, I'll... I'm going to read the Bible for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, then I asked them, something you're going to do for the rest of your life, um, doesn't it make sense that you learn to do it well? If you're going to be reading the Bible for the rest of your life, don't you think you should put in the investment of time and effort to actually do it well? You see, so often we, we read the Bible a lot, but that doesn't mean that we read it well. There, there's this old saying, practice makes perfect, which is actually not true. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice only makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. Okay? What you practice becomes permanent. So if you practice the wrong thing, then the wrong thing becomes permanent. I used to play quite a bit of tennis when I was at school. So I played at at school and I sometimes went to the tennis club as well and played there and in almost every tennis club I ever belonged to there was some old lady who played an upside down backhand and uh, in, in tennis you have sort of two main grips you know you grip the racket one way for the forehand but um, you have to grip it a different way uh, a wholly different way for the backhand and obviously these ladies they learned the forehand with a forehand grip and played that quite well and then they started learning the backhand but they didn't have a coach necessary to tell them to change their grip so they tried to play the for the backhand with a forehand grip and it just doesn't work because you know your, your hand isn't strong enough that way so they they had to turn the racket around upside down like this and play the <laughs> play the backhand upside down and, you know, some of these ladies had been playing upside-down backhands for decades. And, and they could play upside-down backhand as well as the upside-down backhand could be played. But um, their backhand was never going to be as beautiful and as powerful as Roger Federer's because their technique was wrong. They'd taken the wrong technique and practiced that into their lives. And the practice had made it permanent. Uh, and, and likewise, we mustn't just practice reading the Bible. We must practice reading the Bible in the right way. Perfect practice makes perfect perfect. Uh, practice only makes permanent. So if you practice the wrong thing, it's going to become permanent. So that's what we want to do. We want to, and that's why in, in each of the sessions we have um, interpretive tips and guidelines on how to interpret scripture uh, and pay attention to those and take them and practice them into, into your life and into your, your, your devotions of reading scripture. So we all have a certain relationship with, with the Bible. Some of us grew up with the Bible. We 
our parents read us Bible stories, took us to church, Sunday school, we heard Bible stories there. We have a good overview of the Bible. Um, and, and of course, we should be very thankful for that. But, but often that also um, leads to us um, becoming sort of blasé with the Bible coming used to the Bible in a bad way and, and sort of putting the Bible sort of on the shelf and assuming, uh, you know, we already know everything about the Bible. We can very easily become familiar with the Bible and assume that we've mastered it and, and that we've already heard everything that the Bible has to say to us. Some others of us might not have grown up with the Bible. We, we might not know the Bible at all, not have a big picture overview of what the Bible has to say. And there might be a a lot of strange and bewildering things um, in the Bible, you know, from our perspective, things that we don't understand, things that we, a lot of things that we don't know. Um, wherever we are, we can know the Bible better. And the most important thing that we must do if we want the Bible to influence our lives and be the major formative influence in our lives is we must take it and read it. You can figure out all the other stuff as you go along. But the most important principle is take and read. That's the most important principle. There was a young man called Augustine. Uh, he was very intelligent, highly educated uh, young man. Um, but he lived a life of drunkenness and sexual immorality. You know, he lived for his pleasures. Uh, and, uh, but he, at some stage he started becoming really frustrated because he, he thought he could make all the you know, necessary changes in his life through willpower, through, through his own efforts. Uh, but he started discovering after many years um, that, that he just couldn't. Fortunately, I had a Christian mom who was praying for him. And he obviously knew the Bible very well, but he, he sort of despised the Bible and looked down on it as sort of a, you know, a book that was beneath him and beneath educated people. And uh, he writes the following in his, in his very famous Confessions, which was written in around 397 um, after Christ. He says, I was weeping in the most bitter, bitter contrition of heart because of just his frustration with himself and that he couldn't get rid of his vices and sins. When I heard the voice of children from a neighborhood house chanting, take up and read, take up and read, I could not remember ever having heard the like. So checking the torrent of my tears, I arose in interpreting it to be no other than a command from God to open the book and read the first chapter I could find. Eagerly then, I returned to the place where I had laid the volume of the Apostle, that's the Apostle Paul. I seized, opened, and in silence read that section on which my eyes first fell. Not in revelry and drunkenness, not in licentiousness and lewdness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. No further would I read, nor did I need to, for instantly at the end of this sentence, it seemed as if a light of serenity infused my heart and all the darkness of doubt vanished away. And uh, that, that portion that he read was from Romans uh, 13, verse 13 and 14. And it completely, the word of God, remember we spoke about the power of the word to give us life and to change our lives. Augustine experienced that and he became... St. Augustine, who is considered and is considered to be by many the most important theologian uh, between the Apostle Paul and the Reformation. And even in the Reformation, much of the Reformation was built on Augustine's teaching and, and, and what he did. Um, and, and just that phrase, take up and read, take up and read. We, we do well to heed it as Augustine did and allow the Word of God to change our lives in the same way. So two important principles um, for reading the Bible. Uh, let's read together in 2 Chronicles 34 from verse 29 to 33. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, uh, Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the Levites, all the people from the greatest to the least. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant, that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took uh, his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws and decrees with all, uh, all his heart and soul. He promised to obey all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. 
And he, and he required everyone in Jerusalem and the people of Benjamin to make, the same, uh, to make a similar pledge. The people of Jerusalem did so, renewing their covenant with God, the God of their ancestors. So Josiah removed all detestable idols from the entire land of Israel and required everyone to worship the Lord their God. And throughout the rest of his lifetime, they did not turn away from the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So King Judah, uh, Josiah um, led a revival in Judah. Um, and a revival was necessary because Israel had drifted so far away from God's word that they'd actually lost it. The, the, the book of the law had been lost. No one had, knew it was anymore. And then one day when they were sort of renovating the temple and, and just, you know, doing some you know, work on the temple, someone discovered this copy of the, of the law and brought it to King Josiah and he read it and he was so struck, he was so cut to the heart that it, that it changed his life, much in the, in, in the same way that it changed uh, Augustine's life as we read uh, from that quote. And as a leader, as the leader, the king of Israel, he took it and he read it to the people and led them to renew the covenant and commit themselves to obey all God's commandments. And likewise, <clears throat> if we are children of God, if we are Christians, then we are in covenant with God. We are his covenant people. And our covenant with him <clears throat> is to obey him. Now, we don't obey him in order to be saved, but we obey him because we are saved. We don't obey him in order to be accepted. We obey him because we are already accepted and loved by him. <clears throat> so, let's, uh, um, in, in this passage, we learn two, two very important things. Uh, firstly, um, we learn that we must prioritize reading the Bible. From experience, any one of you who've read the Bible a few times will know that not every time you read the Bible, you have this amazing experience of God's presence. And, and um, you, you don't every time sense God's presence and sense God's power. Sometimes it feels a bit dry. Sometimes it feels a bit boring. But, but here's a very important secret to having good relationships in general and especially with God and, and to, to personal devotions with God, whether it's prayer or Bible reading. Sometimes you have to press through duty into the light, as J.R. Packer says. You have to press through duty into the light. Reading the Bible, praying, Spending time with your spouse, for that matter, uh, or with your children, is both a duty and a delight. But sometimes we feel the duty more than the delight. But if you press through the duty, if, you, if you're faithful and press through the duty, eventually you start experiencing the delight of it. So, so like Israel, like, like Josiah, we'll do well to, and, and Augustine, we do well to take up and read. Um, we read the Bible not to have an experience per se, but because we're in relationship with God and we want to hear from Him, we want Him to speak to us. You know, Im imagine you only spend time with your spouse if you really felt in love and infatuated and smitten with them. Or, you know, you, you only spend time with your children if, if you really felt warm, fuzzy feelings about, uh, towards them. That, that wouldn't be a real faithful relationship. That wouldn't be real love, um, actually. Um, and, and it's the same... It's the same with God. We, we don't only listen to Him and read His Word when we feel like it or when we feel warm, fuzzy feelings. Uh, we do it because we're, we're in a committed love relationship, a covenant relationship with Him. Uh, the second thing we also learn is, is to prioritize the reading of the Bible together. Since the Bible is so freely available nowadays, you know, there are millions of copies of the Bible and different translations available. It's available electronically so we can... We can have it on our smartphones and, and, and tablets and stuff. We can carry it around wherever we are. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, it, it often means that um, reading the Bible has become purely a personal, individualistic pursuit, which is, which is not a good thing. Uh, both the Old and the New Testament uh, was designed to be read communally. Um, and most of the reading of the Bible was done communally. I mean, in those days, only... 10 to 15% of people were literate and, and they didn't have books and stuff. You know, you maybe had a scroll that, you know, was in the temple that, or in a synagogue that was, that was read. Uh, and we've lost, as the modern church, uh, this discipline of reading the Bible together. But I think we must um, 
we must regain that again. And, and, and church, Sunday services and small group meetings are, are a great place to do that. Paul actually says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 verse 13, until I come, pay attention to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Uh, and, and the problem is if we only read scripture alone, we, um, we have no one to query our interpretation and to correct our interpretation. And, and when we are left to ourselves, we are going to misinterpret Scripture. But if we do it together, we can correct one another and, and, and uh, reach better interpretations. So here's how we want Bible school to help us read the Bible uh, together and to read it better. So a, a very important aim of Bible school is, is to help you not only know what the Bible says, but how to read the Bible for yourself, how to discover for yourself what the Bible says, uh, and, and how to grow in our ability to interpret Scripture, to give you the right technique for interpreting Scripture, and so that you can then practice it in, uh, you know, like, you know, a good backhand, Roger Federer's backhand, or something like that. Um, so this is how Bible school will help you. Firstly, um, in each session, actually, you'll, we'll study a key Bible passage together, uh, and we'll uh, read the Bible passage in class. Uh, we'll have some questions and interaction around that. If you're in a classroom setting, we'll, or, or you can just sort of meditate it, on it by yourself if, you, um, if you're um, doing it by yourself. Secondly, um, the, the sessions will resolve, revolve around this key passage, and you'll have in uh, opportunity to interpret the passage uh, through through the uh, questions and, and observations that the teacher gives. And, and this means that at the end of Bible school, you know, the two years of Bible school, you, you'd have covered uh, basically 61 key Bible passages, which is quite a lot, uh, which you have read and, and interacted around and, and, and interpreted. Uh, we'll give you interpretive tips, like the principle of context, uh, or like we're going to look at today, uh, in, in Hebrew poetry, I have parallelism. So we're going to look at what that is and how it works. Um, so we'll give you a wide array of interpretive tools um, that, that you can use. Um, and then lastly, uh, a set, uh, uh, this sets a, uh, an example of how you should do theology together in communities. How as, as learning communities, the church as a community of disciples, the word disciple means learner uh, or um, or student. It's like an apprentice. How we can learn together the theory and the practice um, and derive it from Scripture and, and, and apply it together in our lives. Take 10 minutes to reflect on and discuss this session's key Bible passage together with others in your class. If you are watching on your own, take a few minutes to reflect on the key Bible passage by yourself. So the key passage we're going to look at today is one of my favorites. It's Psalm 1. And uh, I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the, the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And we see once again what we spoke about in the beginning of the session. We must consume the word until it consumes us. And here he talks about delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on it. And uh, one of the pictures there, I mean, in the New Testament, I don't think it's any uh, sort of accident that Jesus often refers to his followers as sheep. One of the things that sheep do is they chew the cud. In other words, part of their digestive system is that they, they eat grass, swallow it, and then at, at a later stage at, their, a stage at their leisure, they can sort of bring it back up again and, and re-chew it. Uh, to help with that digestion. And it's the same with us. Spiritually, we are sheep. I think in some ways that's a, a very well-intentioned and loving insult <laughs> when Jesus calls us sheep. Uh, you know, like sheep, we, we often, you know, easily go astray and so on. But part of it is that like sheep, we to, to really aid in our spiritual digestion of God's word, we need to chew the cud. We need to, and, and that's what, what meditation uh, is all about. Listen to what Derek Kidner says about this uh, passage. 
uh, this first psalm. He says, certainly it stands here as a faithful doorkeeper, confronting those who would be in the congregation of the righteous with a basic choice that alone gives reality to worship, with the divine truth that must inform it, and with the ultimate judgment that looms up beyond it. And he makes a very important point here, Derek Kidner, and, and he's uh, one of the better commentators on the Psalms. He says that Psalm 1 is placed there at the beginning of the book of Psalms. Now remember, the book of Psalms is the praise and prayer book of the Bible. It's in fact the longest book in the Bible, which, tell, which tells us a lot about how important praise and prayer uh, is to God. But Psalm 1 is intentionally placed at the beginning of the book as a doorkeeper. In other words, as an introduction, as a preparation for how to read the Psalms, how to pray and how to praise. Uh, and <clears throat> it's interesting, Psalm 1 is not a prayer and it's not a praise song, but it's preparation for praise and prayer. What, it, what the Bible author is telling us here is that the best preparation for praise and prayer is to meditate on God's word. And um, if you want to pray and praise well, then you need to learn to meditate on God's word well, because all of that flows out of and reflects God's word and our meditation on it. Um, it talks about the blessed life. What, it is, what, what is the blessed life? And it, it actually gives um, two ways of life. It, it basically says there are two ways to live. And, and we see this theme throughout the Bible. If you think about in Deuteronomy, Moses says, I call heaven and earth today as witnesses against you that I've placed before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life so that you and your descendants after you may live. Uh, and, and very um, striking that whatever life or death we choose, we choose not only for ourselves, but for our descendants. But again, you see the two ways there. You see the two ways here in Psalm 1 again. Uh, you see the two ways in Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about, uh, you know, the good tree that bears good fruit and the, and the bad tree that bears bad fruit. Uh, in, in the man that, that uh, builds his house on the rock and the other one who builds his house on the sand. It's, it's the same theme of the two ways, the way uh, of, of righteousness and the way of wickedness, the way of wisdom and the way of folly. Uh, you see exactly the same thing in, in, in um, the letter of Jesus' brother James, his half-brother James. Uh, it, it's constantly contrasting the two ways, two different kinds of faith, faith that leads uh, to work and faith that doesn't lead to works. Uh, wisdom that comes from above and wisdom that is from below, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's constantly the two ways. It's, it's a theme throughout scripture. Um, so, so there's that contrast. But, but the main focus of the psalm is not on the two ways of life per se, but on what leads, what produces those two ways of life. In other words, um, it talks about the blessed life, what is the, um, the outcome, but specifically what leads to it, what is the cause um, of the blessed life. And, and we've got to ask ourselves the question, what is the most formative influence in our lives? Okay, what is the most formative influence in our lives? And, and here it shows us that meditation on God's word is not only preparatory for praise and prayer, but that meditation actually is inevitable. Notice it says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, sit, stand in the way of sinners and sit in the seat of scoffers. But by contrast, who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his law day and night. So he's not telling people to start meditating. He's saying, you're already meditating. When you sit, when you walk, when you stand, when you sit, what you do in life, whatever consumes your mind and your heart consumes your life, you're already meditating. What he's saying is, make sure that you meditate on God's word. In other words, meditation is inevitable. You're already meditating. This psalm is just challenging us to start meditating on the right thing, on God's word. Um, in other words, consume the word until it consumes you. Meditate on it. You know, ponder it, mull over it until it becomes so part of your life that, that it shows in every part of your life. And then your life will be, be blessed and prosperous. I just want to read you a few definitions of meditation that might help you. Uh, meditation is to bring the truth into contact with your heart until the triune God becomes so real to you that you seek him with all your being. 
or another one. To meditate is to descend with a mind into the heart and there to stand before the face of the Lord, ever present and all seeing within you. And here's another one that's pretty good. The mind must, as it were, descend into the heart and then the whole soul ascend to seek for and gaze upon the majesty of God. Just a few basic definitions of meditation. And what I want you to see is that meditation starts in the head, but it goes to the heart. And here's what I want you to to do just in practice. Between your time of Bible reading and prayer, insert a time of meditation. So often in our devotional time, we do Bible reading and we do prayer, but they're completely disconnected from one another. And meditation is the key to connecting them. I often struggle, as I think uh, most Christians do, to take what I read in Scripture and to apply it practically in my life. So in other words, often I stumble between my intentions and my actions. And I think meditation is a key to that. Now, when we think of meditation, often we think of Eastern meditation where someone sits like in the lotus position and goes, oh, and empties their mind. But biblical meditation, that was actually stolen from the Bible. (laughs) But biblical meditation is different. You don't empty your mind, you actually fill your mind with God's word and you ponder it, you delight in it and you think it down and um, almost pray it down into your, into your heart. You ask questions, how would my life be different if I truly believed this or if I obeyed this? Um, how, how would I think differently? And then, so, so meditation is preparation. Meditation is inevitable. We're already meditating. We must just meditate on the right thing. And thirdly, meditation is inside out. Notice it says, um, blessed is a man who delights in the law of the Lord. So it starts on the inside and, and it uses a picture of a tree. Now the roots of a tree are underground. You don't see them. They're on the inside. Uh, it, 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 just like that, it, it starts on the inside. So uh, sensing with our hearts rather than thinking. So you, you start by thinking, understanding the passage, but then you, you, as it were, think it down into your heart and you start sensing it, start experiencing it. There's a difference between being told that honey is sweet and actually tasting that honey is sweet. And meditation is where you start tasting the spiritual realities uh, of God. And then out of that naturally flows prayer, prayer where, you, where you pray those realities to God. Um, it starts in, on the inside, delighting. But then the word meditation literally means to mutter. Uh, there's a scripture in Isaiah where it talks about, it uses exactly the same Hebrew word, and it says, uh, like a like a lion growls over its prey. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a lion f- or lions feeding it. Like they, 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 they're on the prey, they, they're chewing it, they're eating it. Um, and the, while they're doing it, they're sort of growling, you know, a dog chewing a bone, you know. And, and the Bible, that's, that's pretty much the word that's used for meditation. You, you, you've got you to chew it like a bone, you know, and, and, and sort of um, it, it, there's a verbal aspect also, muttering it, pondering it, but, but actually saying it. Um, so from, from delighting to muttering, uh, and eventually it affects your life. Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the way of sinners, does not sit in the seat of scoffers. So it, it, it affects eventually what you believe, uh, how you behave and, 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 and what you become. So it's, it's, it's inside out. Okay, so we were busy discussing Psalm 1. You discussed it in, in class. Uh, just a few more things about, uh, about Psalm 1 that we can learn. Uh, one of the tools, one of the literary devices that Hebrew poetry uses is called parallelism. Uh, Hebrew poetry, unlike English poetry, for instance, doesn't uh, use meter and rhyme so much. Well, meter to some extent, but rhyme a lot less, which uh, I suppose we should be thankful for because that means it's, it's much easier to translate because you can't really translate rhyming. But the parallelism that is used, you can actually translate. Uh, so parallelism is where the same thing is said just in different ways, either in repetition in a synonymous way or in a contrasting way, or in a way that adds something to, to what was said before. And the Psalms are full of that. Uh, one of the forms of, of parallelism is called chiasm, from the, the Greek letter uh, chi or chai, uh, the first letter in the Greek for, chri- for Christos, which we translate Christ, is, is the chai. It looks like an X. Uh, and, and, and that's what it is. It, it's, it sort of fo- follows a, a A, B, uh, B, A pattern. Um, and, and we see that, for instance, in the psalm, in the, in the last verse, we, we see it says, for the, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked 
will perish. So he says the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The contrast, uh, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. So um, I, I saw a, a, he, a, a Jewish translation of this where it says, the Lord attends to the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Uh, and, and what that means is you are blessed when you experience God's positive attention on your life. And God will attend to, if you, if, if you attend to God's word by delighting in it and meditating on it, if you attend to God's word, he will attend to your way in a positive way and, and your life will be blessed. So, so you see that parallelism, but you also see it on a bigger scale. That's on a micro scale. On a macro scale, you see it in the, in the whole um, psalm is actually in a chiastic form. So when it says blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And then there's a change and, and, he, and, and he starts using metaphors. And he says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, um, in all that it does it prospers. Not so the wicked, uh, but they are like chaff that the wind blows away. So you use a, a metaphor of a tree for, for the righteous and a metaphor of chaff, um, the sort of outer husk um, of the grain, for, which that has no root and has no nourish, nourishment in it uh, for the wicked. And then... There's another change that goes uh, where he says, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So you see that same A1, B1, and then B2, A2 structure on a macro scale, that same chiastic structure in a, on a macro scale in, in, in the psalm. Um, so let's just look at that. In the A part, the, the beginning and the ending part, it signifies uh, people in the presence of the community. They walk, stand, sit in the presence of others, and they interact with them. Some are righteous and some are wicked. In the B part, in the middle, um, it signifies a simile, a comparison, and, and in some ways a contrast uh, of the righteous and the wicked uh, to both botanical life a tree and, a, and, and chaff. Uh, the righteous are stable, strong, fruitful, and alive. Uh, they are like trees planted by a river. The wicked are transient, uh, weak, fruitless, and dead. They are lifeless like the weightless chaff, the husks, the outer husks of the, of the wheat. And they're just blown around by the wind. They're unstable. You know, the forces of life just blow them around. So you, you see that chaotic structure, and, and here's, here's one of the interpretive tips. Look out for parallelism, but even more on a bigger scale, look out for the structure of a passage. Don't just look at, at what the passage says. First try and understand what is the bigger picture structure of the passage. What's the flow of the passage? Uh, How is it structured? Um, I just also want to read you a few just in continuing this discussion about um, meditation, remember we're talking about consume the word until it consumes you. And meditation on the word is a key way of consuming the word until it consumes you. So I just want to actually read you a few examples. And I think you'll find this very helpful and interesting of people who have meditated on the word and, and um, really found it helpful. One is, is George Mueller. God used him powerfully to start orphanages in England. And I think more than 10,000 orphans passed through his uh, orphanages and he never asked anyone for money. But one of his keys to, to, to living such a powerful and uh, life of faith was that he really meditated on God's word and prayed a lot. And listen to what he says here. He says, the difference between my present practice and my former is this. Formerly, when I rose, I began to pray as soon as possible and generally spent all my time until breakfast in prayer. And this was the result. I often spent even an hour on my knees before being conscious to myself of having derived any comfort or humbling of the soul and often having suffered much from wandering thoughts. I scarcely ever suffer in that way now. I began to meditate on the New Testament early in the morning, searching as it were every verse, not for the preaching, but for obtaining food for my soul. After a few minutes, my soul had been led to confession or thanksgiving or intercession. When thus I had done for a while, I go on to the next uh, words of the verse, turning, as, uh, turning all that as I go into prayer, as the word may lead to it. It often astonishes me that I had not sooner seen this point or discovered the secret. <laughs> And I mean, it's so powerful. We can all relate to that. You, you start praying and your mind wanders and, you know, 
but, but when you meditate on the word, when you read the word, understand it, study it, and then meditate on it, naturally prayer flows out of it. Um, so that's one example. Here's another powerful example from um, Jonathan Edwards. He says, I used to spend an abundance of time in walking alone in the woods and solitary places for meditation uh, and prayer. I very frequently used to retire into a solitary place on the banks of the Hudson River at some distance of New York City for the contemplation on divine things and secret converse with God and had many sweet hours there. I had then and at other times the greatest delight in the Holy Scriptures of any book whatsoever. Oftentimes in reading it, every word seemed to touch my heart. I felt a harmony between uh, something in my heart and those sweet, powerful words. I seemed often to see much light exhibited by every sentence uh, and such a refreshing, ravishing food communicated that I could not get along in reading. I used oftentimes to dwell long on one sentence and to see the wonders contained in it. And yet almost every sentence seemed to be filled with wonders. I found from time to time an inward sweetness that used, as it were, to carry me away in my contemplations. I experienced a calm, sweet abstraction of soul from all the concerns of the world and uh, fixed ideas and imagination of being alone, sweetly conversing with Christ and, wrapping, and wrapped up and swallowed up in God. The sense I had of divine things would often, of a sudden, as it were, kindle up a sweet burning in my heart, an ardor of my soul that I know not how to express. Once I rode out into the woods in 1737, having alighted uh, from my horse uh, in a retired or uh, quiet place, as my manner commonly had been, to walk for divine contemplation and prayer. I had a view that for, mo for me was extraordinary of the glory of the Son of God as mediator between God and man and of His wonderful, great, full, pure and sweet grace and love and meek and gentle condescension. His grace that appeared to me so calm and sweet appeared great above the heavens. The person of Christ appeared ineffably excellent with an excellency great enough to swallow up all thought and conception, which continued as near as I can tell about an hour and which kept me the bigger part of time in a flood of tears and weeping aloud. I had several other times had views much of the same nature, which had had the same effect. And here we see someone, Jonathan Edwards, who had studied God's word and meditated on it so often that it really started impacting his life. And he was the man whom God used to, re to, to lead the first great awakening, uh, where when he preached, people were so touched that they fell off their chairs and, uh, and repented. And we see just in closing in Psalm 1, that meditation leads to blessing, God's positive attention. Meditation leads to life change from walking, standing and sitting in the wrong places you know, breaking those destructive habits and, and, and actually walking in God's ways uh, with His prosperity. Uh, in other words, it's a key to, to forming new habits. Yeah, meditation leads to stability, being rooted, um, planted. Uh, meditation leads to fruitfulness. They bear their fruit in season. Uh, meditation makes you evergreen. You know, when it talks about blessing often in the Bible, like in the ironic blessing, it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's like blessing is God's face, God's pleasure shining on you. Leaves is what trees use, are what trees use to, to absorb the light of the sun and turn it into food and oxygen. And when we meditate, God makes us evergreen. Now he gives us the leaves to be able to absorb his, the light of his countenance, the light of his blessing. It makes us prosperous. You'll prosper in all that you do. And it makes you stand. The wicked will not stand, but the righteous will stand under God's blessing. So I want to encourage you to develop this habit of meditating on God's word. Take it and read it. Consume the word until it consumes you. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord that we can commit ourselves to your word and we pray that you'll teach us to delight in your word, to meditate on it and to live according to it every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Take 15 minutes to reflect on and discuss the following points together with others in the class. If you are watching on your own, 
take a few minutes to reflect on the points by yourself. You can find the discussion points in your Bible School Handbook. Look out for the Living the Word sections in each session.